This is the Digital Savage Experience Podcast, hosted by Roman Prokopchuk, bringing you all things digital marketing, tech, business, and motivation. What's stopping you from becoming relentless in all aspects of life? Are you ready to become a digital savage? Let's get into today's episode. Hey everyone, this is Roman Prokopchuk, and this is the Digital Savage Experience Podcast. Today I have with me Josh Shacknow, who is the host of the Solopreneur Grind Podcast. Thanks for joining me today. My pleasure, Roman. Really appreciate you having me on. Awesome. So how did you come about starting your podcast? What inspired you? How has it been going? Yeah, so I started the Solopreneur Grind podcast about seven months ago because I was and, and still am a solopreneur. So I work full time as an immigration lawyer in Canada. About a year and a half ago, I started my own firm. And after, actually, it was right around the one year mark where I had built up my firm. Things were, you know, starting to go pretty well. And I was getting the hang of the whole solopreneur part, but realized that, I mean, a few things, realized that it can be lonely at times, even when things are going well, even if you're having calls with clients and networking and stuff, you know, you, there's still there's still that so, sort of social aspect that I felt was a little bit lacking. And then number two was as, a, as someone who consumes a lot of content, podcasts included, I felt that there were so many successful solopreneurs out there that might not be millionaires, billionaires, that still have really cool stories and lessons to share. So long story short, I started my own podcast interviewing other solopreneurs like yourself. Uh, you, you, you've uh, kind of graduated into an entrepreneur, uh, but there's so much in common there and, and so many people with really cool stories to tell that I wanted to share them and, and learn from them myself. No, that's awesome. And what's kind of the format of the podcast? Uh, how do you find your guests? Podcast is a, usually between 30 to 45 minutes. It kind of depends on how the conversation is flowing, how much the guest is talking, you know, whether they have longer or shorter stories and the topic of conversation. I like to keep it under 45, 50 minutes. And the way I, I mean, it, it, I break it down into two parts. Usually the first part is going through their story, their journey from whether it be school, like right out of school or from a corporate job and how they broke into the solopreneur or entrepreneurial part of their journey. And then the second half is usually a little more tactical and practical and strategic in terms of what are they experienced at? What do they do for their business? And what tips can they share for people who might not have those types? types of experience. The way I got guests has evolved a little bit. At the very beginning, I went and joined a bunch of Facebook groups. I think there were two or three. One of them's called All Guest for That Podcast. One of them's, I forget what the other one's called. I've mainly been using two Facebook groups and just posted saying, hey, I, I want to interview solopreneurs, let me know. And I got a whole bunch of responses from really cool people. And then what ended up happening is you'll get referrals, right? So you'll have a cool guest on and what you should do if you're a podcaster is ask at the end of all your recordings, hey, do you know any other great guests that you can put me in touch with? Because that's a really cool way to just like in business, right? Getting referrals, that's the easiest way to get new clients. It's also been the easiest way to get new podcast guests. Uh, more recently, I've been trying to um, kick above my, you know, weight class, so to speak. So now that the it's been running for seven months, I've had over I've done over 31 interviews, and I'm actually ramping up to doing two a week now. And the listenership has really grown. So I'm trying to basically reach out to people I may not have thought would talk to me <laughs> when I first started and say, hey, do you want to be a guest? Here are the listeners I'm getting per month. Here's what I do. Check it out. Let me know. It's been working better than expected. Have you tried to uh, monetize it in any way yet? I have not. I have not. I've thought about it a little bit. I think uh, one day I will try to but the focus right now is on creating great content and just growing the followers and the listeners. So providing value to them. I still have my full-time gig. I'm still a lawyer by day and that pays the bills, which is great. So I'm not in a rush 
to monetize it, number one. And number two is that I don't yet, or I don't ever want to sacrifice the quality of the content, right? So I didn't want to start out early by monetizing and sounding sleazy. And at this point, the people who want, who would want to maybe advertise, you know, may not be the big budget or even reputable type companies. I don't really know, but uh, I'm not rushing to it. I think when the time is right, I will see what opportunities are out there. But the main concern is not sacrificing the quality of the content, making sure the listeners are having a great experience. No, yeah, I agree. Um, I started mine with no ads. Now I have a ad that basically follows the interview. So it's not intrusive or doesn't interrupt segments. So I'm right. kind of focusing on on growth and just delivering value in that sense and not trying to make a few dollars, you know, from it currently. Exactly. And I remember, I forget if it was in a podcast or in one of his books, but Tim Ferriss mentioned how he approached monetizing his podcast, which now, you know, I mean, he's in the millions and millions of listens and downloads, but he refrained from monetizing it in any way for the first little while because his his thinking was, I'm going to wait till I have a really big following and then I can go after really big advertisers and, you know, have proper professional ads done well and make a ton of money. You know, like you and I, Roman, aren't in this to make 50 bucks here and 50 bucks there with the chance of sacrificing the quality. We're, we're looking to build quality content and, and a following for the long term. Yeah. And I think it's uh, important to tell people stories like the I've had a range of guests, so I don't really, you know, dissuade having any guests on. I mean, I do a little uh, background information on the guest if they line up with the podcast and with me in general if there's something obviously you know speculative about their past or something in the news where they may not be a genuine person of you know and just trying to get you know positive PR then that's the only reason I mean I have somebody but if you have a story to tell at this like stage of the game of the podcast regardless of how many listeners I have I'm probably not you know going to turn you down I've had people that you know have 200,000 followers on Instagram in terms of one social channel and I've had people with a hundred so I'm not right one of those people I just want to hear a genuine story have a genuine dialogue and you know offer a platform for people to share what they have in terms of knowledge and experiences absolutely how, how did you get your first few guests um I the first few episodes well uh, the first year was just me in terms of commentary, my expertise, right. my experiences. But then I started working guests in. My first guest was my brother that has started his own company. He graduated from Columbia University. So I took it from there. And then I, you know, found a website called Podcast Guests. I listed my podcast and I started getting a lot of inquiries that I vetted and I started getting guests that way as well. Very cool. Yeah, I've, I've heard of the website. I might start using it a little more. I, I've had a few guests from it and I think I need to take a take a closer look. Yeah, and in terms of being on your podcast, someone that I interviewed that I saw did your podcast, and then I ended up reaching out to you. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that was that was a cool. You you end up. I mean, there's so many benefits to doing a podcast. I could talk about it for hours, but one of them is yeah, you never know who you'll meet, and and just broadening your network, hearing the cool stories, and and meeting new people that you wouldn't have met or been connected to otherwise. Yeah, and I think it puts you on a, a global level. So I have people outside of the U.S. I have people, you know, and Japan, Europe, all over the world in terms of sharing their stories. And like you said, building a network and you never know how, you know, you can help each other besides obviously elevating your platform and then elevating themselves as professionals or whatever stories they have to share. Exactly. Exactly. So in terms, obviously, like you said, you, you're still doing the law thing. How has uh, being an attorney helped you transition in terms of skills into being a podcast host? That's a good question. I mean, definitely in terms terms of, I want to say, client communication. So in terms of the attorney side, I mean, the first six months, it was all sales for the most part. It was all networking and sales. And then once you start bringing in clients, it's at least in my line of work, I, I do immigration. There's a lot of back and forth, a lot of client communication. And I always made it a focus of mine to not be like the quote unquote, traditional lawyer, slow to respond, 
tough to understand, et cetera, et cetera. So I've always tried to have my sales kind of process and conversations as effective as possible and my customer success in terms of client communication and stuff like that. So that's transitioned really well because when you're trying to find guests, especially now that I'm trying to climb the totem pole, it's all sales, right? You're trying to get in front of the right people and convince them to come on your show. And then not only that, it's not as simple as, hey, do you want to come? Yes or no? It's okay. They say yes. Well, then you got to book the time. You got to send them the calendar invites, uh, maybe send them a reminder to make sure they don't forget because if they book three months or three weeks in advance or three months in advance, I haven't had three months in advance booked, but three weeks in advance, the person's got to remember. And then what I've been doing as well as a follow-up is once the episode goes live, I do an Instagram live with my guest, just the two of us. And so I got to book that. I got to make sure they know how to do it, when to go online and stuff like that. So a lot of just people, you know, managing people, communicating with people. I, you may not have expected that coming from a lawyer because that's not exactly what we're known for. But when you're running your own law firm, you're not just a lawyer, you're a salesman, you're a marketer, you're an accountant, you're, uh, you know, all that stuff, just like you are with, with when you started your company, you know, you got to do everything, right? So no, yeah, uh, I definitely agree. And there's a lot of stuff that people don't see that goes into producing one episode. So like you said, the scheduling, the getting someone on the, the post, if you have some kind of uh, post commentary, like you said, on Instagram Live, then when the episode is done, obviously editing the audio down or cleaning it up, then if you're sharing it through social, creating the social post, the audio overlays, the caption post, mm -hmm. and everything like that. And uh, engaging with the community. Granted, if you're growing, your engagement may not be as much in terms of comments and different direct messages that you're getting, but you should still, you know, be there if something comes in. So it sure. is labor intensive to produce something like in any craft, but um, it's rewarding and it's, a, I think, a superior medium to other uh, consumption channels of information. Absolutely. I mean, I just, I, every time I, I cook dinner most nights, I'm not too big on eating out and every night, six, six out of seven nights, I'm cooking dinner and I have a podcast going. And most of the times I'm also prepping lunch and I have a podcast going. When I'm walking to and from the grocery store or the office, you know, I, I generally have my uh, headphones in. So uh, it's it's just a great medium for information and to be on the production side of it is, is really cool and, and a lot of fun. Yeah. And I, I kind of switched over like gym time or working out. I used to listen to music and now it's just consuming podcasts because I find it to add more value to me and I learn while I'm exercising versus just simply listening to music. Now, I'm not saying that listening to music is bad, but mm -hmm. it actually helps me to consume information better because you're getting endorphins and you're kind of heightened and more focused in the exercise state. So I consume information better. Sure, for sure. So if someone's thinking about starting a podcast, can you give some uh, recommendations or some advice? Yeah, I would say don't think too, too much about it. If you you're really interested in it or you're liking what what you and I are saying about it, you, I would say pick a niche or pick a topic and just go do it, right? Don't waste too much time thinking about, oh, I got to build a website. I got to buy a fancy mic, whatever, whatever. The first few episodes of my podcast, I did with the headset I got with my cell phone, which I mean, is half decent and the quality was good enough, but it was by no means high quality production. I hosted it on pod. I still do host it on Podbean, cost seven bucks a month. You can host it for free on websites like Anchor. Anchor.fm, and I'm sure there's other options as well. You don't even need a website, right? You just need to host it somewhere and then create a social media account to promote it. And that's that's really all you need. So I would say take a day or two, think about what you want to do, what your goals are, like what you're trying to achieve with this. Are you trying to, you know, do something like Roman and I do and, and hear cool stories from people? Are you really interested in skateboarding? Are you really interested in, you know, whatever, insert topic A here and just go do it because it takes very little time and money to get started. And after a few episodes, you'll know kind of whether this is is something you're really passionate about and, and whether you could stick to it. I would say thinking of the topic and the motivation behind it is important because if you don't have a good reason other than, well, Roman and Josh said it's a good content medium and maybe I can monetize it one day, then you probably won't get through episode 10 because you're going to lose the motivation. You won't feel like editing. You won't feel like promoting it and stuff like that. So just make sure you're doing it for the right reason and then jump in and slowly you're going to learn as you go. Your production's going to get better. You're going to upgrade 
upgrade. I just bought a new mic two weeks ago and you up you update as you go. No one's gonna make fun of you if you're at first 10 episodes aren't that great, especially if you're having cool conversations. What kind of mic did you get? I got the Rode NT-USB, I think it's called. I'm not a hardware guy, so I was using after the first few episodes, I was like, okay, I should probably get something more than a headset. So I got a $55, I think it's the Blue Snowball off of Amazon. And that was pretty good for a few months and then it broke. So I was talking to a good friend of mine and he's like, man, if you're going all out on this podcast, which it sounds like you are, you should make a, you know, make a half decent investment and go all in on it. And I said, you know what, you're right. So I think this one was about 260 bucks, which isn't, you know, horribly expensive if you've got enough cash in the bank and I really like it I've noticed a difference and uh, it it makes me more motivated to get on the podcast and just continuing to improve the content week over week yeah I I used a cheap mic to begin with also I have the blue Yeti it's the bigger version oh, yeah. of the snowball so I, I like it so far it was recommended by a you know a musician actually that that uses it for music and vocals so okay. you said kind of like in its and its price range, it's kind of uh, the industry leader. And mm -hmm. I've had uh, ever since buying it, I think when I switched over to interview format, for the most part for my podcast, it's the, the audio has been really uh, improved than it was before. Yeah, and, and don't stress that at the beginning, right? Like you and I started with cheap mics. Uh, I, think, I think you should start with a cheap mic because you don't know if you'll be in it for the long run. And there's something kind of cool about upgrading as you go, you know, build building and, and growing and improving. So I kind of like that aspect to it. And then you can go back and listen to your early episodes months down the road and like laugh at how bad it is. And you know, oh, the quality sucked. I didn't know how to ask questions back then. It's it's part of the process, right? Just just embrace it. No, I agree. And uh, at this point, um, I'm happy in terms of the direction and the growth of my podcast. And I'm even now thinking about building like a mini sound booth in the house. So it's kind of soundproof when I'm recording at home. Yeah, that's definitely an end goal of mine. I'm, I'm living in an apartment with a roommate right now still. Our lease is up in October and I already know the next place I move into needs to have like some little room or area or something that I can kind of turn into more of a recording studio because of how cool that would be. But for that, that that's a few months down the road. That's probably a 2020 problem for Josh. Yeah, I've been looking at kind of DIY things and I think I'm going to destroy the house if I do it, but <laughs> we'll see. Yeah podcaster goals yeah i mean i'm i'm generally interested in people's stories and even when i'm networking and stuff like that learning about people so this is a great medium like you said networking with people around the world and being available that way so mm -hmm. absolutely so in terms of things that motivate you, um, in terms of the podcast, in terms of your, your legal profession over the years, that may have changed, but what motivates you today to kind of be your best, to produce the best content, to um, be the best podcaster, the best attorney you can be? Yeah, there's a few motivations. Definitely, I mean, number one with the podcast is to share other people's stories because I know what it feels like to go through the struggle. I mean, that's why my brand is called Solopreneur Grind. So if you if you follow me on Instagram or on YouTube, I also put out content just kind of documenting my journey. I'm still going through it as a solopreneur. And it's a lonely journey. And because you're often working alone, even if you have like an assistant or something like that, or even if you work with one other person, it's it's lonely. There's, there's no other way to put it. And it's not like you do a great job and then you get praised by your boss boss or you're you know you get promoted and stuff like that right I remember when I had my first really really good month with my law firm I was super happy like when I saw the the billings for the month was super happy made sure to celebrate and then you wake up the next day like the, the first of the next month and you're like oh crap I gotta go do that again and work just as hard if, if, if I'm gonna make just the same amount right if you want to grow if you want to keep growing you got to work even harder so it's a grind at uh, for sure and I just want to highlight like the stories of people who have been through it to help motivate other people that want to get started or are still going through it or maybe they're in their third month and they haven't made a sale yet and they're doubting themselves and they don't know if they made the right decision because I've been there and I think we still all think about those things a little bit here and there so no, number one is is putting out that type of content to help people through their own solopreneur journey number two 
personal growth. So I want to keep getting better, whether that's growing my firm, whether that's growing my following on Solopreneur Grind, helping other people, uh, learning. So in terms of getting more listeners and converting more listeners to my email list, because that's probably my favorite form of communication is my email list. I send three emails a week uh, with you know tips and, and linking to my content and stuff like that. So I'm trying to improve, right? If I got 10 email subscribers last month, I want to get 15 the next month and then I want to get 20. And you know what I mean? That, that competitive side and the personal growth side. And then number three, I'm not going to deny that I want to make money, right? I mean, that's at least ingrained a little bit in most entrepreneurs and solopreneurs when they get started. If, if I didn't want to make a lot of money, that might be another reason why I still work for somebody else. But when you're working for somebody else, there's only so much money you can make when you're building your own businesses, your own podcasts, your own products, your own services, especially with the internet, the sky's the limit. So do I need a million, a billion dollars? No, but I mean, I, I definitely want to be a millionaire one day. And I, I think that I believe so much in what I'm building right now and that I can do it, that I think it's a means to an end in the financial sense as well. No, I agree. Um, I think everyone's driven by something different, but obviously people People do have things they want from a material sense and to live a comfortable life. So I think regardless if you're doing it as a passion or you're still kind of um, in the trenches or working a corporate role that you're getting paid but may not be happy with, uh, some level of drive is connected to money directly or indirectly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Especially in the solopreneur and entrepreneurial side. And there's nothing wrong with it, right? If, if you're in it for the wrong reasons. So I would say maybe if money is number one on that list, it might be, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm not really sure. It's like, who am I to say whether your, your primary motivation should be helping people or should it be money? I, I can't really judge on that. But I can definitely say that I want to live a certain type of lifestyle and that lifestyle cannot be supported on a thousand dollars a month. You know what I mean? Right now, I actually do live quite frugally. I don't think I'm not a very material person, but I want to have the financial and, and personal freedom and independence to not have to worry about going for an extra few dinners a week or, you know, going on a, vac a couple extra vacations a year and, and stuff like that. Yeah. And I think it's not only just uh, the, the want of material things, you have a safety net with, you know, finances. And if you have money, you can make more money in situations where then you can pursue your passions even more. So a lot of opportunities are presented when you have the funds to invest, uh, to purchase things like stocks, uh, you know, equity in different businesses. So that whole saying of, you know, you make money when you sleep, eventually I want to get to that point. A lot of people do as well um, from a more, you know, scaled perspective. And it's hard when your money is tied to time. So untying that leaves a lot of options open and pursuing passion projects like hosting a podcast that your end goal may not necessarily be being sponsored, but, you know, sharing as many stories as possible. Absolutely. That, that's a great angle to uh, kind of like a similar, similar end and, and motivation, but with a different explanation. I, I completely agree with that. So in terms of things that you've experienced through your career in law and the seven months you've been a podcaster, something that has been an adversity to you that you you've taken and, you know, transformed into a win. Ooh, that's, that's a toughie. I think we face so many adversities as solopreneurs and entrepreneurs. I just find that it's such a mental battle to be honest, in, in terms of the business side of things. And so I wouldn't necessarily say it's it's one event, but I remember, I'll never forget the six month period of when I started the firm because it was a six month struggle in terms of not just trying to get sales and build a business, right? Doesn't doesn't matter whether it's law or digital marketing or e-commerce store or whatever. The first few months, you have to go out and make sales and, and start growing your revenue. And so there's the difficulty of doing that, especially if you're a first time kind of salesman or entrepreneur. And there's a difficulty from the mental side in terms of belief in yourself, confidence, doubts. I mean, I, I could be, I could still be in a, in a law office making a half, you know, pretty good salary, definitely more than what I made in my first year working for myself. And, you know, you have that stable income and you have that slow growth income, but you're tapping into someone else's office every day. So for me, it was it was really tough mentally 
to go through those first six months and bring in those first few sales, do the work, impress the clients, start bringing in referrals. And even while you're doing the work, you can't stop your sales process, right? Because let's say you land a few cool clients and you start doing work for them. If you spend a whole month doing work for them and then finish and they say, thanks, see you later, you now don't have any other clients because you haven't been doing any sales for that month that you were doing the work for them. So it's like, how do you build this? How do you get the snowball rolling? I'll say, you know what I mean? Get those first few clients in, get a sales process up and running that's repeatable. And how do you get it through your head that you can actually do this, that you're making the right decision, that even though people might be doubting you or they might not even be saying that they're doubting you, but you can kind of tell that people in your social circle are like, what are you doing? You know, you're giving up other good opportunities to fight through that. So it toughens you up real quick is what I'll say. So when I started the podcast, it was kind of a walk in the park because I had been through it from the law firm and I was approaching it more as a passion project to start. So it wasn't as serious. I wasn't looking to monetize right away. My intentions were meet cool people, have cool conversations. And uh, and that's pretty much it. Just, yeah, I would say the mental, the mental side of things as a solopreneur is, is interesting much more important than I thought it would have been. No, yeah, I agree um, in terms of that mental uh, side and mental health in general. So entrepreneurs, founders, they have a, a higher, I think, uh, percentage of depression and suicide. So I think mental health and in, in professions where it's you, regardless of what it is, it's you, you know, dealing with all these, you know, trials and tribulations versus being in a structure where you have a safety net, you know, maybe at a corporation or, you know, not generating sales and business for yourself as well. I think people don't see, I mean, they see, let's say, you know, Elon Musk create, you know, Tesla and, and other companies, but you don't see him, you know, sitting there and, you know, close to being like losing his mind in the process. Yeah, and his money. I mean, this is this is a guy who on paper is worth hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars at times. I don't know if he is right now or not, probably is. But this guy's been weeks away from losing everything after selling PayPal. I think he, I think he made like 115 million from the sale and then he just flipped it right into his next businesses. Like when Tesla, Tesla needed more money, he put it in personally. His story is amazing. For anyone who, for anyone who doesn't know it, look into, read biographies of these successful people. People. I always, I, I recently read Richard Branson's, really highly recommend that biography. But it's, even if you're not on those guys' levels, with which most of us are not, right? They're the 0.0001%. It's tough, man. It, it's it's really tough, even if you're doing well. And, and the one thing I usually say to people who are thinking about getting into solopreneurship or entrepreneurship is two things. Number one, if you don't do it, nobody's going to do it, right? It's, it's you, you can't pawn this off on somebody else. And number two, every day is a blank slate. You can do anything. And so it's kind of tough to figure that out, right? You, and you, it's trial by fire. How much time should you spend doing sales? How much time should you spend doing marketing? How much time should you work on your website and improve it? How much time should you be podcasting? There's no rule. There's no right or wrong because everyone's business is different. Every person is different. So I've actually been vlogging about that a lot in the last month about priorities, time management, even the balance of how much should you work, right? Because you're not in a nine to five, 40 hour a week job. You can work 24 seven, 365. Well, you, you, you couldn't, you couldn't work 24 seven, 365 because you'd drop dead, but you could theoretically work 20 hours a day, every day of the year if you wanted to. But is that good for you? Is that good for your business? Is that good for your long-term health? Probably not. So how do you find the right balance? It's, it's tough. Yeah. And eventually there is the growth and there's only so much you can do by yourself. So you reach a level, you're going to need other pieces that kind of take that 20 hour work day away from you and some of the things that you can automate some of the things that are repetitive you can have an assistant do or hire a role for where like you you and your knowledge base is focused on more of the tactical side and the top level things that can keep growing your business mm -hmm. and it's so important and it, it's that's another thing I, I like to explore these areas because there is no right and wrong so you have to figure it out right there's no rule that says when you hit five figures a month, you should make your first hire or your first hire should be a VA working X hours a week, or this is when you should bring in a sales guy, right? There's no hard rules for this. So one way to learn 
or, or to help yourself through it is to hear what other successful people have done in their situations and try to apply it as best you can to your own. No, I agree. And I think you should, it's your own journey in that sense, because you're the one that's responsible for your own success. So I think people get a, a little phase looking at other people or comparing themselves in terms of, you know, their business is doing, you know, so much better, but I'm doing all these additional things. Why that doubt being created in somebody's mind. So I think focusing on your own road and your own path, instead of looking at you know, people around you or even people discouraging you, like you mentioned, um, family and friends may, you know, say you're crazy. Why don't you do something safe? And it's a little evident also I've seen on LinkedIn. So if somebody changes their, uh, their job, if it's something working for another company or like a well-known company, let's say Facebook or like a, a dream job in, in its corporate sense, they're going to get, you know, a hundred likes, 200 mm -hmm. likes. If it's something like, you know, the, the status has changed to you started your own business, that's going to be like 10. So it's right. funny. There's that weird thing where people will support you if you're working more for another company. But if you start your own venture, you may be crazy, but the crazy ones are the ones that are driving innovation and success and build uh, building billion dollar companies that are going public right i mean it, it's it's societal norms right so the societal norms are you go to school and then you get a job and you work at company x and maybe you move to company y and then you retire and not all of us are cut out for that so so when you go against that you're gonna get you might get some of that whatever we call it negative attention let's say or negative energy but without those people yeah you don't have tesla you don't have airbnb B. You don't have Amazon without those people. I think one of the reasons why there's that negative energy is a little bit of jealousy is people who are stuck in the nine to five or are choosing to stay in the nine to five and they know that they want something more. But for whatever reason, everyone has their own reasons. They haven't yet. Maybe they're afraid, they're worried, they have a mortgage to pay, whatever, whatever. And I think there's probably a little, little speck of jealousy in, in seeing someone step outside the norms and it looks kind Kind of exciting to them and they wish they could kind of make you know do the same thing as well but uh yeah the, the other thing i will say quickly is i have a great support system so I, did, I don't want it to sound like i you know all my family and friends were doubting me and, and making me feel bad they definitely weren't but you do kind of get that sense from the people around you it's not set out right you know what i mean but there's just that that outlook kind of like how you said it with LinkedIn, where you just kind of feel it. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I didn't get that many likes or, oh, this friend isn't so excited about, you know, you could just kind of tell that, that they, there's some doubt there, which is, which is fine which is fine, it's motivating. No, I agree. And I think also people want instant gratification with anything and they don't necessarily want to go through the process or understand what the process is. They see someone make a company and is now a millionaire at age, I don't know, some obviously are younger than others, 20, 30, 40, some are 50s or, or higher, but they want instant gratification. And I think there's a quote that I like. It's uh, It says, everyone wants to uh, be a lion, but nobody wants to do what lions do. So basically go out there and hunt and create your own success. So mm -hmm. it's one of those things where I think it's it's like the, the jealousy and the, like you said, and the wanting something, but not being able to maybe, you know, attain it in that sense, but want that instant gratification. Right. And the other thing I love is it, it takes 10 years to create an overnight success success because especially these days with social media you see all the success you see the huge people with the huge numbers with the flashy cars and you have no idea you have no idea what went into it and that's another reason I wanted to start the podcast was let's see what it took let's get down to the bare bones right I think a lot of the content out there especially the podcast with the millionaires interviewing other millionaires it's hard to get down to the nitty-gritty of what they actually did for like those first six to twelve months like, what did you do? What was the day to day like? How did you get your first customers? And those are some of the questions that I make sure to ask on my podcast, which is, okay, maybe you're doing super well now, or maybe you're just doing well now. Like maybe you're making a hundred grand a year, which is really great. If, if you built it on your own, that's really great. 
But what were the first six months like? How could John or Sarah or Sally do something similar if they have similar interests or similar ideas? You know what I mean? So really kind of fleshing out those practical tips and strategies and mindsets that people took. No, I agree. And it's important to understand like every part of the journey, the beginning, the middle and the end, because like you said, if it's towards the end or you're already successful, you may not connect as well, even though that person may talk about, you know, their pain points in the past, it's nice to see what people are going through in the present to get to what their end goals are. Yeah, I mean, as as someone who's not a millionaire, I don't even care about the end of these successful, well, I shouldn't say that. I don't care as much about the end of their stories, right? I want to know how they got from zero to five figures a month or zero to half a million dollars a year because that's where I'm at right now. I'm trying to, I mean, I've had five figure months and they're awesome. I want to keep growing though and and I want to know exactly how people in similar situations kept that momentum going, kept the growth going, how they spent their time, how they got those clients, how much time they take off on the weekends, what their mindset is during the day, how they schedule their, you know, all all these practical things that are tough to get from a a big mainstream piece of content. And uh, especially if it's not super long form going into a lot of detail. No, I agree with that. I mean, it's important to um, see all the points and basically looking at what the pain points or, you know, bottlenecks may be in that next step that you're looking to take as well. For sure. Exactly. So what's one thing you can uh, leave with the audience in terms of a tip or advice, professional or personal? I would say probably the biggest theme that I've learned not just from the last year and a half of running my own business, but from interviewing over 30 entrepreneurs now that are that are successful is you have to take action in some way or another, at least, you know, semi educated action, right? You don't have to spend months studying and preparing, but you do have to get in mind, get an idea of what you're good at, or what you like, or what a a potential business could be, or a potential podcast show could be, or a potential, maybe you just want to grow a YouTube channel or something like that. Do some digging, research, get even two to three ideas, do enough learning so that you can start and then start and just, just get at it, put stuff out there. I was so hesitant. So I'll say at the beginning of January, it was in my, uh, one of my resolutions or like yearly goals was to start a vlog, put it on YouTube. And I was like, this is going to be so weird. My podcast, it's all audio. I'm not in front of the camera. This is the first time I'm going to be in the front of the camera. Who the heck wants to watch me sit in front of a camera in the morning and do it? I do like a five to seven minute vlog. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to see what happens. I've been doing it Monday to Friday every day since the beginning of January. And I get some listeners. I don't get a ton of viewers. I, although I also upload, I multi-purpose it. So I upload the auto audio onto my podcast. That's actually been doing quite well. I don't get that many views on YouTube, but I'm just going to keep doing it for six months and, and see what happens. Because when I've tried other things, whether it be for my firm or my podcast, the brand, Solopreneur Grind, when you try things, when you put yourself out there, when you go to that networking event, when you send that cold email, you never know what doors it could open down the road and you never know what it could lead to. Or you could learn, you could learn a good lesson, right? At the very worst, I spend six months putting out a video, um, Jane, you know, five days a week, the very worst, I'm going to get much better at speaking on camera. I'm going to get much better at sharing my thoughts and organizing them in my head. I'm going to get much better at organizing YouTube content. And I'm going to have a lot of content to use on Instagram, right? Because I can I can take quotes from my vlog and put them on Instagram. I can repurpose them into emails. So think what's the worst that could happen. And, uh, you know, try, try and realize that it's probably not as bad as you think and, and look at the upside instead. Yeah, and I think uh, there's value in failures as well as long as you're learning something and kind of to tie with that i'd like to say that time isn't your friend so you may think you have all the time in the world but something you know traumatic may may happen to yourself family member that may throw everything off so you need to be trying and failing as fast as possible yeah the other thing i thought of at that time was what if i went through 2019 and didn't try this vlog knowing how much I thought about it, how much I believed in it, how much I was kind of excited about it. And I thought, what would I think January 1st, 2020, if I didn't even try it? And in my head, I felt pretty pretty upset, pretty disappointed with myself. So that's that's also a big part of the motivation behind it. Yeah, and it's getting past that kind of fear. I actually put put off creating a podcast. If I did it when I wanted to do it, it'd probably been, you know, like three years ago, but right. I finally pushed myself to do it, which is nice because obviously I'm active 
acting on it, but the time in which and the speed that I wanted to have done it, you know, something I don't necessarily regret, but I wish I could turn back and possibly do it a little sooner. Yeah, if, if you've read any Tim Ferriss, I've read his book, Tools of Titans, which is a great book. It basically, it's it's short chapters on each of the guests he's had on his podcast. And one of the questions he asks almost everyone is, what would you tell your 25-year-old self? A lot of these are like super successful people, so they're in their 30s and 40s. And the main answer that kept coming up in the book, at least that I kind of pieced together after I've read the book twice now, is I wish I would have started earlier. And it doesn't matter what it was. It's just, I wish I would have started earlier, right? Some of them are athletes, some of them are business people, some of them are social media, you know, stars, whatever, whatever. The main answer that kept coming up was I wish I started sooner. And that's always stuck with me. Yeah. And I think it's a common theme. So it's been a pleasure having you on. Can you tell the listeners how they can find you? Yeah, Roman, really appreciate the opportunity to chat the Solopreneur Grind podcast. You you can find it on my website at solopreneurgrind.com. You can find everything on the website, the podcast. You can join my email list. You can find the vlogs there. If you want to follow me on Instagram, that's where I put out. I put out content every day on Instagram. It's just at Solopreneur Grind. I, I, you know, post kind of behind the scenes stuff. My thoughts, I usually go, I'll upload like a 20, 30 second video every day and quotes from my podcasts and stuff like that. If you just want daily motivation and and other business insight. Awesome. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, Roman. Really appreciate it. Have you ever thought about starting your own podcast? When I was trying to get this podcast off the ground, I had a lot of questions. How do I record an episode? How do I get my show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all the other places people like to listen? How do I make money from my podcast? The answer to every one of these questions is really simple. Anchor. Anchor is a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing your podcast. Best of all, it's 100% free and ridiculously easy to use. And now, Anchor can match you with great sponsors too, so you can get paid to podcast. Without Anchor, I don't think I would have ever started a podcast. It's so easy to use and I record most of my episodes from my phone. So if you always wanted to start a podcast, make money doing it, go to anchor.fm slash start to join me and the diverse community of podcasters already using Anchor. That's anchor.fm slash start. I can't wait to hear your podcast. This podcast has been brought to you by Nova Zora Digital. Find out how Nova Zora Digital can help your company grow online. Learn more at NovaZoraDigital.com. Until next time, all you digital savages.